Hello, my name is John May. I've been involved in the security and hospitality industry for 32 years. During this time I've had to use first aid on a number of occasions for many and varied reasons. First aid is a vital skill that may assist you to save a life both in the workplace and at home. Apply first aid. In this unit you will learn the following. Assess the situation. Apply first aid procedures. Communicate details of the incident. Evaluate own performance. On completion of this video, you will have a theoretical understanding of occupational health and safety, CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, EAR, expired air resuscitation. We'll look at the biggest killer in this country last year, heart attack and stroke. We'll look at the effects of choking, electrical shock, nose, mouth and head injuries, burns and epilepsy. We'll look at the effects of asthma, poisons, strains and sprains, fractures, bleeding, both external and internal, embedded objects and reporting to emergency services, personal hygiene and infection control, fainting, shock, the effects of intoxication and drugs, heat exhaustion and hypothermia, chest injuries and crush wounds, hyperventilation, diabetes, report writing, spinal injuries, spontaneous pneumothorax, chest and ear injuries, head and back injuries, and we'll also have a look at bandaging techniques. Assess the situation. Apply first aid procedures. In all emergency situations, the rescuer must assess the situation quickly, ensure safety for the rescuer, victim and bystanders, call for help, commence appropriate treatment. Dr ABCD is a way of remembering the six steps to follow if you discover someone who requires emergency treatment. Dr ABCD stands for danger, response, airways, breathing, compressions and defibrillation. Danger. In this first step, you need to assess the situation for anything that may cause danger to yourself or further harm to the person needing assistance. Here we have a person on the floor. Let's take a look at the immediate dangers to both this person and you, the first aider. Firstly, we have an electrical cord. This may or may not be live. Secondly, let's have a look at the dangerously balanced box on the cupboard. Thirdly, we have an armed intruder behind the cupboard. These all may represent dangers to both this person and you, the first aider. Now let's have a look at removing the dangers. In the case of the power cord, it might be as simple as flicking the switch and removing the plug. With the box on the cupboard, it might be a simple relocation of the box. With the intruder, you may need to call the police. Remember, your safety is of paramount importance. If you're injured, you won't be able to assist the person on the floor and or yourself. Response. Assess the victim's response to verbal and tactile stimuli, ensuring that this does not cause or aggravate any injury. Give a simple command such as open your eyes, squeeze my hand, let it go. Then grasp and squeeze the shoulders firmly to elicit a response. A person who fails to respond should be managed as if unconscious. A victim who shows only minor response, such as groaning without eye opening, should be managed as if conscious. If the victim is unconscious, you need to put them in the recovery position and begin steps A, B, C, D. If the person is showing signs of consciousness, put them into the recovery position. The recovery position is very important as it assists in maintaining an open airway in the event that their tongue falls back and blocks the airway or they begin to vomit. This is how you should put someone into the recovery position. Put the arms out at right angles, bend their leg and gently roll them onto their side using your knees to support their back.
Airways. Tilt the victim's head by placing your hand on their forehead. The head should be slightly facing down. Now you clear the mouth of obstructions. Anything in the mouth must be removed. Breathing. The technique used to check the victim's breathing is look, listen and feel. In this technique, you look at the person's chest and abdomen to see if there is any movement. Listen to the mouth for breathing and feel the chest and abdomen for signs of breathing. If at this stage the person is not breathing, move them onto their back and begin CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Compressions. Rescuers should start CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, if the victim has no signs of life, for example, unconscious, unresponsive, not moving, and not breathing normally. You will have to both breathe for the person and pump their heart. This means you will also be required to carry out rescue breathing. Mouth to mouth rescue breathing. Tilt. Kneel beside the victim's head. Maintain an open airway. Blow. Take a breath. Open your mouth as widely as possible and place it over the victim's slightly open mouth. Whilst maintaining an open airway, pinch the nostrils or seal the nostrils with rescuer's cheek and blow to inflate the victim's lungs. Because the hand supporting the head comes forward, some head tilt may be lost and the airway may be obstructed. Pulling upwards with the hand on the chin helps to reduce this problem. If you know or see the person is wearing dentures, do not remove them. Dentures can help the rescue breathing process by supporting the person's mouth and cheeks. Remove the dentures only if they are broken or become so loose that they block the airway or make it difficult to give breaths. Look, listen and feel. Look for rise of the victim's chest during each inflation. If the chest does not rise, possible causes are obstruction in the airway, inadequate head tilt, chin lift, tongue or foreign material, insufficient air being blown into the lungs. Inadequate air seal around the mouth or nose. If the chest does not rise, ensure correct head tilt, adequate air seal and ventilation. Following inflation of the lungs, lift your mouth from the victim's mouth, turn your head towards the victim's chest and listen and feel for air being exhaled from the mouth and nose. Mouth to nose rescue breathing. The mouth to nose method may be used where the rescuer chooses the victim's jaws are tightly clenched or when rescuing infants and small children. The technique for mouth to nose is the same as for mouth to mouth except for sealing the airway. Close the victim's mouth with the hand supporting the jaw and push the lips together with the thumb. Take a breath and place your widely open mouth over the victim's nose or mouth and nose in infants if possible and blow to inflate the victim's lungs. Lift the mouth from the victim's nose and look for the fall of the chest. Listen and feel the escape of air from the nose and mouth. If the chest does not move, there is an obstruction, an ineffective seal or insufficient air being blown into the lungs. In mouth to nose resuscitation, a leak may occur if the rescuer's mouth is not open sufficiently or if the victim's mouth is not sealed adequately. If this problem persists, use mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. It may be found that blockage of the nose prevents adequate inflation. If this occurs, mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation should be used. Mouth-to-mask rescue breathing. Mouth-to-mask resuscitation is a method of rescue breathing which avoids mouth-to-mouth -mouth contact by the use of a resuscitation mask. Rescuers should take appropriate safety precautions when feasible and when resources are available to do so, especially if a victim is known to have a serious infection, example HIV, tuberculosis, hepatitis B virus or SARS. Position yourself at the victim's head and use both hands to maintain an open airway and hold the mask in place. Maintain backward head tilt and chin lift. Place the narrow end of the mask on the bridge of the nose and apply the mask firmly to the face by simultaneously pushing down with the thumb on the mask, elevating the jaw into the mask. Inflate the lungs by blowing through the mouthpiece of the mask with sufficient volume and force to achieve chest movement. Remove your mouth from the mask to allow exhalation.
Turn your head to listen and feel for the escape of air. If the chest does not rise, recheck the head tilt, chin lift and mask seal. In difficult circumstances, the rescuer may need to be in a slightly different position. Ideally, there should be two rescuers for mouth to mask rescue breathing as interruptions to chest compressions should be minimised. Failure to maintain backward head tilt and chin lift is the most common cause of obstruction during resuscitation. To start CPR, use two breaths in four seconds. Sometimes this alone is enough to trigger a person back to life. If it doesn't, start compressions on the heart. To begin, visually determine the centre of the chest. This is the recommended method for determining the compression point on a victim's chest as it is a simple method which helps to minimise pauses between ventilations and compressions. Be sure to avoid compression beyond the lower limit of the sternum. Once you have obtained the compression point, place the heel of your hand on this point with the fingers parallel to the ribs and preferably slightly raised so that pressure will not be exerted directly on the ribs. Then place your other hand securely on top of the first. All pressure is exerted through the heel of the bottom hand and the rescuer's body weight is the compressing force. Therefore, the rescuer's shoulders should be vertically over the sternum and the compressing arm kept straight. The lower half of the sternum should be depressed by one third the depth of the chest. This equates to at least four to five centimetres in adults. A victim in the late stages of pregnancy would have pressure on internal organs if lying flat. The pregnant victim should be positioned on her back with her shoulders flat and sufficient padding under the right buttock to give an obvious pelvic tilt. Rescuers should perform chest compressions for all ages at a rate of approximately 100 compressions per minute, almost two compressions per second. This does not imply that 100 compressions will be delivered each minute since the number will be reduced by interruptions for breaths given by rescue breathing. A universal compression ventilation ratio of 30 to 2, 30 compressions followed by two ventilations, is recommended for all ages regardless of the number of rescuers present. Compressions must be paused to allow for ventilations. Evidence has demonstrated that interruption of chest compressions is associated with poorer return of spontaneous circulation. Both lay and healthcare professionals experience difficulty in determining the presence or absence of pulse. Therefore, rescuers should minimise interruptions of chest compressions and CPR should not be interrupted to check for a pulse. If you have multiple rescuers, ensure one rescuer has contacted the emergency services. All equipment available has been obtained, that is, defibrillator and that the rescuers frequently rotate, approximately every two minutes to reduce fatigue. The rescuer should continue cardiopulmonary resuscitation until signs of life return, qualified help arrives, it is impossible to continue, that is exhaustion, an authorised person pronounces life extinct. Defibrillation. Survival from out of hospital cardiac arrest in Australia remains poor, with approximately less than 10% of victims leaving hospital alive. Factors that have been identified to affect the outcome include CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation and early defibrillation. Evidence to date supports that early defibrillation delivered within a pad public access defibrillation mode may improve survival following cardiac arrest which occurs outside of hospital and in public places. Defibrillation should preferably be undertaken by trained lay people or health professionals. As trained personnel may not be available immediately, untrained bystanders should also have access to the use of public access defibrillators. Programs are needed to support the broader education of the Australian community in emergency response and cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR. Implementation of public access defibrillation should be developed in partnership with local emergency medical services and provide for data collection and audit of events.